list. And so we have a lot of people that have uh, been involved with anything I'm going to talk about. Just to highlight a few before we start is um, Daniela, my student at Warwick, has done a, is, um, helped me with all the biochemistry near the, uh, of the fluid flow points at the end. Uh, Kai has done all of the in vivo work that I talk about in, in this talk. And Chris Neal, who's, done, uh, who's worked with me on a lot of the EM and the electron microscopy. So, so here we have a glomerulus isolated and it's not playing. So there we are, it's playing. It's, what happens is we have it's a ball of capillaries and we'll put some concentrated albumin on the outside and it shrinks. So what we have is we have a, so we have an osmotic pressure change by putting the um, albumin on the outside and it should and it'll go forward and it visibly gets smaller. Um, and so what we do is we can we can take this without using so we can so, so the rate of change on the volume divided by the pressure distance gives us the water permeability. And we can non trivially um, automatically segment that into uh, to take out this shape and measure the volume over time. And the reason it's non trivial is because of all these lines you get from the mixing of the albumin. So this is like when you wheel on the toilet and you can see it all mixing, those are these lines which make this separating this very, very difficult. Um, but we can do that, now. we can do it by hand as well, so it takes a long time. But we can go on, and we're interested in this, suddenly it, it'll start shrinking at this point, and we're interested in this gradient up here. And what we find is that if we take some, if we take some healthy glomerular, I think these were done in uh, these are either in rats or mice. I can't, I can't remember offhand because we've done it in both. But there's, um, you have some healthy. They have genetics. This is increased, and then if, if we add a drug that recovers it, it comes back down again. So something is causing this change of permeability in disease, and. The glycic helix, is the, as, as Charles alluded to, is, is one of these things that we think it is. It, 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 it's a filter on the surface of all blood vessels. And a kind of a semi-aside when we look at this. So this is a very crude model of um, a layer of glycic helix. Perfect layer. It's lovely. And it's going to go over an airy disk. So what this is, it's, it's the... It's the, the point, the diffraction limited point from the focal point of our microscope. So this is for a light microscope. And what we find is what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this across, the, across this point. Usually with a laser scanner it would be the other way around, you're moving the, la the laser beam is moving, but you could move the stage instead. To, to, to determine how thick we think the glycocalyx is by light. And what we find is in a perfect system with a very good lens or something that is very, very flat, we find that if we take sort of, the, sort of the intensity, we take the peak intensity, when it's very small, we take the brightness, how bright this is when it comes out of the microscope, it's a nice line, and then this sort of goes wrong as it gets wider and wider than the, than the point. On the other hand, we can look at the same thing, we can look at the full width half max, and we look at how wide the glycocalyx is when we just measure the width in our light uh, micrograph. And for very small values, it's absolutely rubbish. And then once we get to very large values, it starts, you know, the, the four with half maximum works. Now, this is for a perfect system. Now, if you're trying to do something in blood vessels or something that's 3D, that's curved with different types of light and all of these things that you get and noise and all of this stuff, this line, in essence, moves further that direction. And as you can see, the glycocalyx thickness of around this region is what we're interested in. So we can't simply use the full width half maximum as a measure of glycocalyx height. And we can't use intensity as a measure, it falls right in between. So the way we get around this is by using, in, is by using two different colours. 
and you can therefore put in the glycogen, you can put in a membrane dye that, that, that just likes the endothelial membranes, and you can put in um, wheat gem gluten with some, with some fitzies, that's green, and you can see there's red on the outside and green on the inside, and we can find the centre peaks of those, because they're independent, so they don't get blurred into each other, and then we can find those centre peaks, and therefore we can measure by doing a profile, we can measure those centre peak points and get, an, and get it's correlated to thickness, but it's not actually the thickness because we're measuring it from the centre of the glycocalyx, which we've assumed is a lovely, perfect band, not varied, with the, um, with the, with the membrane wall, which is probably both the membranes in an endothelial cell, which is in itself 200 nanometres thick. So it's, but it, correlates to it and it moves along with it quite nicely. So we can get dynamic measurements by doing this. You can put in a pipette inside a vessel and you can image it in the three modalities, modalities and change things. That's good. We can also take the, take the same vessel and image it in an electron mic um, microscopy which has a much higher resolution and it and, but it's static, it can't change, and we end up with, alce so this is alcyon blue. The reason we use alcyon blue for this is because we can see it with our eyes, and so we can find the same vessel very easily. It's not the best stain for glycocalyx, but it's one of the easiest ones to do this very difficult method of finding the same one with. Um, it's quite a large molecule, it's got copper in it, the copper is what we can see in the electron microscopes, the heavy metal, but it's not that dense, and it's, and it, it's not doesn't give a particularly nice glycocalyx, but you can at least measure the height, this height difference, and so forth. So, we can also tie that in to, hopefully this will play, is we can perfuse in some, say, albumin into the blood vessel, and we can measure the concentration of the albumin escaping into this area here. And so we can measure the permeability of albumin at the same time as the change of depth of glycocalyx in EM and in light. And what we find is that as the, uh, the permeability increases, or if we increase the permeability by destroying the glycocalyx rather, we find that there is a, there's a drop in glycocalyx in light and by the light method and by the electron microscopy method and it's with the increase of it, the increase of permeability. So what that tells us is that the change in glycocalyx depth coincides with a significant increase in, uh, in the microvascular solute permeability. Well that's, that's all very good. So we can do the same method and this has just been just been accepted um, we can do the same thing in a glomerulus, and we can. And this is quite nice over the endothelial cell, which means we don't have that double membrane problem that, that I was talking about from the membrane dye. And we can see we can in diabetes, it's much less and it's missing, and we can recover that some effect. And so the glycocalyx is definitely related to permeability, but how it actually works, and it, is it the only factor, or is it just correlated to permeability? We don't actually know. So let's look at some of the factors which affect how a fluid transports over that wall. We have the depth, how deep it is, how much of this filter it's got to go through, the spacings of the fibres, how far apart they are. And we end up, so we have this. If the spaces are a certain distance apart, we have this available space in the middle that our solute has to go through. If you have a bigger solute, it's actually got less space in the middle, but we choose our solute, so we don't worry too much about that in this, for, from the glycocalyx point of view. But also, it's not just the spacing. It's also the lattice. If we have a triangular lattice or hexagonal lattice with the same spacing, there's less space here than there is here. So, this means that we need to know this. We can't just know the spacing. We've got to know how it's structured and ordered as well, if it is ordered. And the, also the fibre thickness. How thick these fibres actually are is a very, very important factor. So jumping slightly sideways to how we can measure this, 
um, general electron microscopy protocol. What we do is we take our stuff, we fix it, or technically we immobilize the, uh, the, the, the tissues. We then stain it, dehydrate it, put it in some plastic, and then do some electron microscopy on it. So it looks something like this. Usually it's glutaraldehyde, uranium and osmium, some alcohol to uh, get rid of all the water, and then so put it into EPON, and then usually use an 80 nanometer thick section. There's lots of artifact and trouble with these two particular steps. And for glycocalyx, calyx, we, um, we, we, have to do, we have to do special staining as, as well, but that's, that's neither here nor there, like the Alcyon Blue, for example. And so here's a glomerular capillary. This is, um, so here's the lumen. Here's our uh, podocytes, the glomerular uh, basement membrane. And here's our glycocalyx along the top. Now this is with tannic acid stain, and it's quite, it looks quite lumpy. And what we can do is we can take sections of this and do what's called autocorrelation. And so I'm not sure how well you can see my hand on the screen. So in essence, autocorrelation is if I have two identical images, they look the same from projected through, we overlap them, that's highly correlated. Okay, so we get a big giant peak. If I move it slightly, there's none. Move it a bit more, there's some correlation, but not a lot. And so we get a map of correlation, and we can find out, therefore, which are the regular spacings. Because as I move it, not correlate, you know, every time I move it the same distance, we get a peak. So we can take all of those peaks and we can, from lots of different samples, and we can plot them. Now, the first thing you'll notice when we do that is it's a mess. We have lots of different things, uh, lots of different tissues here. Like just to, let's just look at the mean, uh, the mean down the bottom for now. We've got a spacing around this 20 nanometers, and we have the spacing around double it. And we also have sort of peaks in the square formation and the hexagonal formation. So every time we rotate an object round, right, it's, it's a fixed system here, but as I rotate it, you get lots of different spacing. So you expect just to find peaks where it all nicely lines up and the rest of it's a bit of a blur, which is what we've got. However, there's several problems with this. There's three main ones. First of all, the membrane location. Where are we on the membrane? Is it at right angles and all these sorts of things? The stain, we saw it was all lumpy, that's not really very good, it's not really what we want. And section thickness, how it is an 80 nanometer thick section. So we're going to approach these different problems. So the staining, well, instead of using the tannic acid that we did, we, our favorite one at the moment is lanthium dysprosium glycosaminoglycan adhesion technique because it um, spells Lady Gaga. <laughs> and what this is, is it's lanthium dysprosium ions, which are actually, even though they're very dense metals, are very, very small. So the principle is they can get inside the glycocalyx, and actually it's technically more of a positive stain than a negative stain. And when we look at that, we, we find something like this. So this is our glomerulus inside the, inside the kidney, and roughly the, it's electron microscopy, but it's roughly the size of a light field of view, light microscopy field of view. And then we can go down into an individual kind of capillary. Uh, we've got all the foot processes and so, and so on. And we've got our glycocalyx layer on top, which is, which is like so. Now, it still looks a lot of a mess. But you can just start making out that, it, that there's very, it's much finer mess than the previous sort of lots of lumpy things. So we want to look at this in three dimensions. So what we can do is instead of cutting an 80 nanometer thick section and putting it in a transmission electron microscope, what we can do instead is just scan with a scanning electron microscope the, the surface of the, of the block. And so what we find is this. So we scan the surface, and then we get backscattered electrons coming off, and then we use an iron beam to take off another 10, 10 nanometers, I think it was in this case, take off 10 nanometers, and then image again. And so now we have our glycocalyx along the top, and you can see the barrier quite nicely. And we can go on, and this, this is quite good for a volume of around the 4 micron cube kind of size. There's other techniques if you wanted a much bigger volume. But the principle of the scanning works very well. And 
We can then put it into a nice 3D format and you can just about see before it goes behind, there's lots of sort of bushes and, and lumps of this tufts of this glycocalyx sticking up. So here you go, lots of tufts. And we can do lots of other things with the subpodocyte space, which is a different topic entirely. Now, if we just take some stills with that, you know, it's not great resolution, it's scanning. We're not expected to get re resolution, it's about 30 nanometers. We can make out fenestration, slit diaphragms, and if we flip it on its end, we can see those weird gaps appearing, certainly in this particular plane, but we can take out the fenestrations. So this is an ideal way of determining the whole coverage, because it's all very well taking some glycocalyx, and so not glycocalyx, but if there's big swathes of area where there's no glycocalyx, then the fact there's a little bit of filter over here is going to make no difference at all to our, what's totally, what our total filtration sort of effective coefficient. But to go with higher resolution, we still have to stick to TEM. And the method that I like is uh, tomography. So tomography is a very simple system. What we have is we have our section, which we make a little bit thicker. We make it about 300 nanometers thick. And it's a plane like so. And we're looking down on it. And if I want to see this in 3D, I can look around the side of it to look in. Being an intelligent mammal, I turn it instead. So I don't have to move. And I can see it in 3D, and that's exactly what we do. It works in the same way as, the, uh, as a CT scanner in a hospital, although, of course, they move the camera around in that case. So take us what you will from that. <laughs> so the advantage of this is instead of seeing a big projection of a big, big thick, we've got a nice thin, we can take a 3D, we can find a nice thin line through the middle. And so this is some raw data. It's blurry because it's thicker. That's fine. I've put on these little markers here, so because it's a nanometer scale, every time it moves, it, it's going to move. You have to realign all the images, so that's fine. I then take into account the plastic, and the plastic, when we put the electron beam on it, all shrinks in the z direction, and so it's quite you know, a significant amount of shrinking. So we can do that. We just observe it tilted, and we can see the thickness. Just, just shrinking in, so we can measure what it was to start with, so we can reconstruct it out, that's all fine. And then we have, we get this, this is the same, uh, this is the reconstruction of what I just showed you, and you can see the individual fibre. Yes, it's all blurry and noisy, but that's tomography, you can't do anything about that, but we can make out these individual fibres. You can make out a double membrane layer just about, so that means we're getting low sub five uh, nanometer resolution, and you know, we can see all these pathways individual fibres, and we can do sensible things like make it look pretty. So we can make it into this kind of, it's sort of a rice crispy mesh in this particular sort of case. Um, and we can take the, we can do the autocorrelation thing again. And so we're taking, so take lots of squares roughly like this, and we do get our peak. So it's working, we've got, we didn't have much structure in it, it was all the same. This is just one sample, randomly taken, lots of angles and all that sort of thing. So I didn't really expect much. And so we're getting there. We can do the experiment, but we have But we now need to actually go and do it on sort of more the, with, with the permeability all measured in the light microscopy. So that's the stage we're at. So we can measure depth, fibre spacing, lattice spacing. That, we've got methods to do that. We know what the solute is because we choose it. That's fine. Now, the fibre thickness is a problem because we're staining the fibres themselves. Now, we do think there are, ways, uh, there are ways around it, which I'll come up to, but we haven't actually done them yet. And then the other is, it's all under sheer stress from the, from the flow of the blood. So they're the other two problems that, that we have. So just briefly, the approach to the fibre thickness is we can actually, we should be able to take idealised fibres individually from those tomograms, but we need to take thousands of fibres, we're not just a few, and then we can average them all together, and it should be able to tell us the structure of the fibre. So that's one thing we're trying to do. The other thing we're trying to do is do everything frozen, so then you don't have the stain at all, you can just, like, uh, you can plunge freeze it in liquid ethane or high pressure freeze it to get glass like ice so it doesn't have any crystal structure in it and we can try and look at it like that so this we're, we're at the beginning stages of working on that 
What would be much better is if we could isolate the glycocalyx helix in its entirety and then image it by AFM or EM or whatever we want to, whatever modality we want. And then you can get, so this is just a, a different proteoglycan structure, and you can get, you can see that it's quite easy on an SEM to get things of interest in terms of all we're interested in is the effective fibre diameter, remember, with this. So if we can separate it, and we think we can using a series of size of columns and, and charge exclusion columns, on perfuse, because you can't do it on cell culture, because it's all, what you get in cell culture is, is just, it's rubbish, really. It's not the same as what you get in real stuff, in real things. And that's where glycocalyx research is struggling. And we can't just have to do it with perfusions and so on. Right, more what I find more interesting is the, the wall shear stress. So the blood comes in, and this is meant to be a parabola, but I, I couldn't draw one. So we have a velocity profile, and this drags on the side of the wall. The blood drags on the side as it goes through. And the permeability is probably affected directly by the, by the flow in itself, by, by changing the glycocalyx. But actually, more importantly, the glycocalyx develops differently depending on the shear stress. So for both reasons, it's very important. Uh, to be able to measure this as well. And what we're interested in is the force, which is the, the velocity gradient at this point. And the trouble is, normally it's all measured by bulk flow, which is not very good. And so you're measuring the idea of the flow is, and you predict what it is at the corner. But blood vessels are particulate, pulsatile, complex fluids, in, in a complex, elastic, structured walls, and even the non-slip assumption might be effectively broken because they don't really know where the edge of the wall is, where it's meant to be, where the velocity is meant to be zero. So all of these things make it really, really hard to measure. So I, with some friends, now friends rather, they were colleagues, they're now friends, um, developed this, this, so this is a, well, we didn't develop the virus, this is a bacteriophage, they exist in nature, There's, and it's the M13, it's a piece of string. And we can take our piece of string, which is about a micron long, but seven nanometers wide, and we can take those and we can bind by our cysteine link at one end to a surface. And we can do that to any surface that we choose within reason. I mean, you have to learn how to do it, but in essence, there's no reason we can do that to any surface. And then we can coat the whole thing in a fluorescent dye, and therefore we've got this, what looks like a sausage, in the light microscope, because remember, we've got the diffraction limit of light, so it looks like it's still it looks like a lobby sausage. And in this case, I've tethered it to just a collagen four flow slide. And it's taking on a spinning disc, ten frames per second. That's neither here nor there. It, it doesn't really matter. Any light microscope will do this as long as it's got a half decent camera. And this is played at five times speed. And so here we go. It's jiggling about quite happily. And at some point very soon, there's some flow. Points in the direction of the flow. Excellent. And it jiggles around, and then it should go in the flow the other way. There we are. So that sort of solved the problem, but it's better than that, because direction isn't a force. The force has a direction and a, and a force vector, magnitude. And so if we plot the angles at all, uh, and we, so if I put on an expected shear stress over it, we find that they all join together. It gets wider and wider the lower this goes, and therefore the variation of the angle gets greater. And so what's happening is we're balancing this Brownian, the Brownian force with the flow, with the force from the, the liquid, and it's pointing, and therefore it's pointing in the right direction and oscillating less. And we can plot that, and it comes out, it's a Gaussian distribution, which, because of time, is what we expect in a 2D system, so that's all, that makes it even easier. So that works out all fine. We can plot it at different shears, and we find that they're each individually a straight line. That's important for what I'm going to say after this. And this one would happen to be a bit, of, this one was shorter, so we think it had broken in the purification. But because they're all the same length, or should all be the same length, they should all have exactly the same straight line here. So we can take that and put it on a cell. And here it is on a cell. Yeah, it wasn't great, 
there's a, for those of you that do cell culture, you can tell what I've killed most of them. But here we are. Here's our phage going on. And the reason I'm talking slightly long is because I'm waiting for the flow to start. Just to point out something for you, when the flow starts, soon, there we go. The flow is this direction. It's parallel to this cell. And we can take it, and we can look at it individually. I forgot to start the uh, other timer. So. But look, the direction is not parallel. It is off at an angle. And if we plot that all, what we find is this, is when the flow is in that direction, it goes reasonably in a straight line in this direction. That's all fine. When I point the flow in this direction, it, first of all, it started here, and then it rotated around. Now, the shear stresses which I calculated out of this, right? okay, they're very high. Maybe that's real, maybe that's not. Maybe there's a calibration point for the error. But the point is, is that they were all straight lines before, and these do not go up in a straight line. They go up and they're down um, it's several times. And over here, in this direction, it's even worse. And as I say, it changes its direction. So the conclusion is, that we can't just measure the shear stress by bulk flow. The surface of the cells, it depends on their local topography. And so we can't just assume things when we're dealing with them. And so as a summary, um, we already know the glycocalyx is related um, to the reason for changes in permeability. We don't actually know, uh, sort of confirmed much more than that. We can measure permeability and hydraulic conductivity with light microscopy. We can already do that. We can measure most of the glycocalyx parameters affecting permeability with electron microscopy. And the fiber diameter we're getting there. And in principle, we have the local wall shear stress. We can, if I develop that technique more, we can then do that at the same time as everything else, because it's still just fluorescent microscopy. So we can add that in and get all of the data together, and then hopefully. We can tell whether the difference in permeability and disease are explained fully by the glycocalyx or whether there's other things that we need to take into account as well rather than fixating on the one thing. And I'd like to stop there.